Thank you so much for being on the programme this evening. You're here to talk about what you're describing as a child poverty epidemic. What's that all about? Well, what's happened is that we had the big rises in heating costs two years ago. We had the big rises in food prices a year ago. And people have somehow think that, well, we're through the worst. Actually, for very poor families, it's the combination of all these things, the not having any more savings, the emergency payment stopping, charities not having enough resources to help them, food banks sometimes running out of food. All these things have come together to make this the worst year for children in poverty. And we've got to do something about it. It's an emergency. It's a crisis this winter. And of course, it's got these huge side effects because we've got children who can't afford, uh, or the parents can't afford toothpaste, they can't afford soap, can't afford shampoo, can't afford winter coats. And so you've got a cleanliness problem, you've got a health problem, and something has got to be done uh, to make life better because we're sacrificing the future of thousands of children on the altar of failing uh, to take into account that we've got to do more about their poverty. I feel like, unlike many other former leaders who you know, seem to spend a lot of time you know, going around Davos or whatever, you're someone who's very rooted in your community in Scotland. What kind of things are you seeing? Well, I grew up in, 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 in the town and the county uh, where, where I now still am. And I saw, when I was growing up, a lot of poverty because it was a mining and linoleum town and life was changing and people obviously were finding it very, very difficult as jobs were lost. Uh, and there was a lot of slum housing still. But when I look at the conditions that now exist for many families, they're as bad as they were then, and they're back to where they were then. Uh, and it's because the low-income families in this country are facing multiple deprivations. Uh, the benefits have not risen in line with inflation, and therefore they're out of pocket already if they're trying to buy, say, clothes as well as food and heating. Children have been doubly hit because we've got the three two child rule and we've also got also we've got this family payment that's been removed. Then there's a cap on benefits and then there's deductions. So if you've gone onto universal credit and you get a loan for the first five weeks and don't get a payment, then you're permanently in debt to what has become the biggest debt collector in the land, and that's the Department of Work and Pensions. So half the people on benefits now have got deductions, they're paying back these loans that they should never have had to take out in, in the first place. And it's the combination of all these things that are making things worse for people. You, um, talking about benefits there and universal credit, there's of course a limit, a uh, two-child limit, on the number of children you can claim child benefit for, and there is evidence to show that that's pushing larger families into poverty. Would you like to see that two-child cap? What, what, what I'd like to see is a review that is successful in making sure, and this is the test of this, that families with children have the basic necessities of life provided for. And remember, three-quarters of the children in poverty that I'm talking about are in families where someone is working. This is not like the 1980s when it was mass unemployment that caused the problem. This is families where someone is working but they're not making enough, they cannot make ends meet. And we know that from nurses, we know that from uh, other professions, they cannot make ends meet because the costs of bringing up a child have been so, have, have been so much rising. And of course these basic necessities, uh, like soap shampoo and so on, have been going up in price as much and perhaps more than some other commodities that people have got to buy. I can see you trying not to be unhelpful to Keir Starmer there, but you do think the two-child limit should go, don't you? I think the two-child child limit, I never supported it, but what I do think is this, that you need a root and branch review of universal credit. And I think, I, think I, I, can exp I can explain, I think, why this is for him uh, the right thing to do. There are so many elements now of the universal credit that have come under review. That, but the test is not really one element. The test is, does it meet the basic necessities that families in work have got to be able to provide for their children? Does the, the reform or the review make sure that these essentials can actually be provided for? As you say, it's, a, it's an obscene uh, situation and you're a very strong advocate of this as well. Um, you've been talking about the kind of immediate crisis in the winter. Looking a little bit further forward, it could be that we're going to see the first Labour Prime Minister since yourself. Um, how ambitious do you think um, the next government needs to be? Well, I, I see my role uh, as raising what I think are problems that have got to be dealt with. I don't, I don't think I can, with the knowledge I now have, uh, suggest what is the only or the right solution. And I think you've got to leave it to Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves to decide 
what the fiscal arithmetic is going to be, what their priorities are for the first uh, few, few months, uh, how they can get legislation through the House of Commons, depending on what the majority are. These are all questions that you know, I, I'm not going to sort of speculate about because that's, that's for them to decide. I think the important thing is that we send a message uh, that uh, a country that needs change will have change. And I think we mustn't forget those people who've been left behind in the last uh, 40, 14 years. Now, when I'm trying to persuade people to do things, I, I, I'm acting in a non-partisan way because I want everybody to understand whether they're a company director or the leader of a charity, that something has got to be, got to be done here. So the important thing, I think, is sending a message that we, if we can find a way of all working together, we can do something about this very big problem in our midst. Uh, at the same time, though, you know, <clears throat> you're Chancellor for 10 years. You have got this kind of wealth of experience, one of the very few people, you know, in the club, if you like, uh, in the in the United Kingdom. Uh, so I'm going to ask you, and I'm, I'm sure it's, you know, I, can, I can see the reaction already, but, but I am going to ask you about uh, Labour's uh, commitment to the £28 billion a year on green spending. Now, we understand that that number is, is going to be ditched. With your experience, you know, you, you've been in the Treasury, you've seen the numbers, and it feels to me that there's a kind of two debates about this. That there's a one side who say, this isn't going to work, it's going to put debt up. And then there's the other side who would say that actually you need that kind of investment uh, in order to create jobs, in order to boost growth, it will pay for itself in the long run. Who's right? Well, look, if Keir Starmer asked me for advice, uh, I'll be very happy to give it privately. But I think you've got to leave some of these decisions to someone who's working on the ground, who knows the kind of problems he's going to face, who's assessed what his uh, fiscal room for latitude with Rachel Reeves is, and who's made a decision on that basis. So I feel that uh, we should leave that decision to Keir Starmer and to, to Rachel Reeves. You don't who, want to be a backseat driver. I, I, I neither want to be a backseat seat driver or to be someone who pontificates uh, from, from the sort of the outside as if I knew everything because I'd been in government. Quite the opposite. The situation has changed. We are in a new uh, fiscal uh, uh, cycle. Uh, our economy is not growing. I mean, the best we can hope is we get to 1% over the next year, and that will not be enough to keep standards of living rising, or alternatively, to pay for our public services. So these are difficult decisions that Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves have got to make. If they ask my private advice, I said I'll give it, but I, publicly, have they asked? publicly, publicly, it's, it's for them uh, to, make, to make the decision, and uh, not, not today. No, they haven't asked for my advice about any decision. If it's being made today or not, I don't know. Um, you obviously care deeply about the economic situation, the cost of living crisis, the, the poverty epidemic, as you put it, that will take money to sort out. And there are some people who say, look, we don't have money. Look, look at the scale of the debt. This is what we need to do first, rather than spending, as Labour would do. Yeah, but look, when, when you think of uh, the easing of poverty, one of the ways that we can ease poverty is helping deal with some of the problems of low pay. Now, some of these problems of low pay are not about public spending. They may be about the living wage, they may be about uh, people who are in low-paid jobs getting the training and skills to get into better-paid jobs. It may be something to do with how we provide childcare and what could be done about that. There's a number of ways that we can deal with the problem of poverty that don't actually uh, commit you to massive amounts of public, public, public expenditure. And I think we should be thinking about how we can relate the creation of good jobs to the relief of poverty. And I think uh, there are probably a million people in this country who could move from a low-paid job into a better-paid job who would not then have to claim universal credit, who would be paying taxes instead of uh, not, not, not doing so, and actually the country would save money rather than lose money by getting people into better jobs. Uh, and of course this is a global uh, problem as well, not just a domestic one too. Um, I, I had to say I really enjoyed uh, your kind of gag to my colleague Kay Burley uh, when you said you're too old to be PM in the UK but too young to be US President. Yeah, it doesn't go down well in America. Yeah, I bet that, <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> we enjoy it, perhaps less so uh, across the pond. Um, are you concerned at all about the prospect of a Donald Trump presidency? Yeah, I, I have written about this, and uh, you know, I would normally say that any British leader should keep out of American politics, and they would say any American leader should keep out of British politics, but I think we've got to sound uh, some worry about what's likely to happen. If Donald Trump were elected, he's promised a 10% tariff on goods, so you've immediately got a trade war. He wants to leave the World Bank and the IMF and all the international institutions that are responsible for trying to get international cooperation. We don't know what he's going to do on Ukraine, so there is a huge doubt as to whether you know, a sovereign state, Ukraine, can actually be protected under a Trump administration. So I think we've got to tell the Americans that we in Europe are really worried 
about what could be the consequence of this Trump administration. And if these things were to happen, to have trade wars, protectionism, to have Ukraine uh, let down, uh, and also not to know what he's going to do about China and the Middle East, uh, these, these are huge issues, not just for America, but for the whole of the world, and particularly issues for, for Britain and Europe as well. So I think uh, on this uh, instance, we've got to speak out and say, look, we are worried about what the policies that he's proposing are. You know, he wasn't prepared to be president in 2016, probably never expected to get the job. Uh, now he has got a whole series of institutes working on detailed policies. Some of them really do uh, fright, frighten most people around the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So be more robust, uh, if you like, and not being afraid to say what we I, I think um, I, that, you know, while it's, it's normal not to comment on other countries' uh, ele elections because it's a democratic process, I think when you receive uh, information about statements he's making about what he's going to do in his relations to Britain or NATO or Ukraine or Europe or the Middle East, uh, and trade wars that would actually cause a lot of uh, damage to jobs in Britain, we, we, we've got to be prepared to speak out and say we are, we are worried and we are concerned. Uh, just finally, <clears throat> um, Rishi Sunak got into some trouble uh, this week after making a point about transgenderism uh, at Prime Minister's Questions when the mother of the murdered transgender teenager, Brianna Jai, was in Parliament. Uh, he hasn't apologised, should he? Well, when I made mistakes, I did apologise. And uh, look, every Prime Minister makes mistakes. I, I don't think you can say that uh, every Prime Minister will fail to make some mistakes. But I think uh, you should apologise if, if, if you get things wrong. And uh, I mean, it is a very sad uh, and, and really tragic, tragic case of, of a family in, in grief. And I, I know he's uh, said he's compassionate about the family, but, but, but perhaps uh, he should uh, do what I had to do on one or two occasions and apologise. And I do accept that you, 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 if you make mistakes, you've got to uh, correct them quickly. Thank you very much, Gordon Brown.